Jesus often talked of little things, a little leaven that could raise an entire loaf of bread, a small candle that could light an entire dark room, a little salt that could savor an entire meal. He spoke of a tiny mustard seed of faith, a pearl of great price, a lily in the field. He knew by small and simple means great things could be brought to pass. Were the world willing, observing one simple law, love God and your neighbor, could replace all the vexatious complexities of government and legalities and actually heal our world, love would ensure there would be no poor among us. No one would live isolated or alone. We could live in peace and harmony. Simple? Yes. Easy? Evidently not. But heaven has a plan. It has always had a plan, and it involves homes and mothers. Poets and wise people have known, O oh, wondrous power, how little understood, entrusted to a mother's mind alone to fashion genius from the soul for good. Pope Pius the Ninth knew, Give me good mothers and I will change the world. Napoleon knew, The great need of France is mothers. Muhammad knew, Paradise is at the feet of the mothers. Helen Hunt Jackson knew, Oh, if the world could only stop long enough for one generation of mothers to be all right, what a millennium could be begun in thirty years. The very foundation of our national life is laid in the home, and the wife and mother is the center, the mainspring of all true home life. Our wives and mothers have as yet hardly entered the outer chamber of the beautiful edifice of the ideal home of the future. It is the holy of holies, and in it lies the very secret of human progress. The highest civilizations have scarcely as yet glimpsed the possibilities of home. The Norwegian poet Henrik Ibsen said, To the woman, then, we must look for the solution of the problems of humanity. It must come from them as mothers. That is the mission that lies before them. Behind the Greek poet Pindar, who was given credit for ushering in the golden age of Greece, were two women, Cleardus and Myrna, who sang songs into his heart. Behind the great Pericles was the influence of his cultured and refined wife, Aspasia. Behind the first martyrs for religious freedom, seven noble and strong sons, was their Jewish mother, Hannah, pleading with them to stand strong in their faith, though it cost them their lives. Behind the greatness of Julius Caesar was his mother, Aurelia. Behind two thousand stripling warriors were mothers who never doubted. Jesus' first teacher was his mother in the home. She remained a support to him his entire life. When his disciples fled in fear, she was found kneeling at the cross. History has accorded the mother scant recognition her biography has seldom been written, and the annals of time record scarce more than a passing word to bear testimony to that potent influence which, more than all else, has shaped the destinies of the world's distinguished men. When the great Swiss educator Pestalozzi studied the problem of the misery around him, he concluded, The eternal laws of nature lead me back to your hand, mother. Mother, I can keep my innocence, my love, my obedience, the excellence of my nobler nature, all at your side only. Maternal love is the first agent in education. If I can only in some slight degree succeed in making the art of education begin in the sanctuary of the home. He died feeling like he had failed, but holding on to the hope that even if it took 300 years for his ideas to take root, his work would not be in vain. Inspired by Pestalozzi, Friedrich Froebel picked up the torch. The first kindergartens were formed to train mothers to teach in their homes. The government shut him down because they saw the kindergartens as a threat to their authority. But other educators caught the same flame, Maria Montessori's work was primarily aimed at mothers of young children in the home. She said, 
It seems so self-evident as to be almost a childish statement to assert that only two things are needed in order to establish peace in the world. Above all, a new type of man, a better humanity, then an environment that should no longer set a limit to the infinite desire of man. A better humanity is the job for mothers, and then that better humanity will build the better environment. Charlotte Mason also wrote for mothers in the home, where the woman receives from the Spirit of God himself the intuitions into the child's character. Despite all the evidence that mothers in the home can shape the world, we find ourselves in a culture that demeans and devalues motherhood and homemaking. The very movement that was meant to elevate motherhood, that claimed mother love works magic for humanity, has devolved into something that would horrify the founders of the women's movement, who, by the way, never had children of their own. A hundred years ago, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, who had helped bring Montessori ideas to America, reflected that a process has been going on for a long time where the so-called natural and domestic occupations will be taken away from us, the women, and the very shame of our enforced idleness will drive us to follow men into the workforce. She added, but that time is still in the future, and here is the opportunity for us, the mothers, perhaps among the last of the race who will be allowed the inestimable delight and joy of caring for our own little children, a delight and joy of which society, sooner or later, will consider us unworthy on account of our inexpertness, our carelessness, our absorption in other things, our lack of wise preparation, our lack of abstract good judgment. Do you feel that directional pull in our world where women are told they have more value in the workplace than at home? Do we not see more institutionalized child care at younger and younger ages as the new normal for society? We, as guardians of the world's most important natural resource, the hearts of children, cannot let that happen. If we are inexpert, we will gain expertise. If we are careless, we will care more. If we are absorbed in other things, we will redirect our focus. If we have lacked in wise preparation, we will redouble our efforts, and in so doing will form good judgment. What we will not do is lose our right to the inestimable delight and joy of caring for our own little children. Because the world needs right now what only we can offer, and heaven needs us to carry out the plan in creating a world where there is no contention in the land because of the love of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people. Women have been told by spiritual leaders, You will play a crucial role in the grand times ahead. You sisters, your daughters, your granddaughters, and the women you have nurtured will be at the heart of creating that society of people who will join in glorious association with the Savior. You have brought with you a spiritual capacity to nurture others and lift them higher towards love and purity. The marvelous potential lies within you, and you are being prepared for it. If the task seems too overwhelming, that also is by design. You cannot do it alone. If you live up to your privileges, the angels cannot be restrained from being your associates. The idea of turning to mothers in the home to solve humanity's problems may seem too small and simple. But if the spread of a tiny virus can bring the entire world to its knees in a matter of months, couldn't an idea whose time has come have the same spread for good? The Lord has promised that he will cause righteousness to flood the earth. We have good reason to believe mothers play a crucial role in bringing this promise to pass. You have the spiritual power to change the world. I see women beginning to awaken to their role with a fire in their belly. This movement doesn't require legislation or fanfare or public rallies or fundraisers or awareness campaigns. It is passing quietly, 
undetected by the world at large, from mother to mother in her neighborhood and through her network of friends and family. I see a safety net being woven around the world in small and simple ways, as God's work always is. Our homes are being made places of refuge and safety. Let us see to it that the priceless efforts of childhood, priceless because they mean the development of inner power, are never ridiculed nor discouraged, nor set aside as worthless, but rather that they shall be encouraged. God never meant that any human life should be a failure. And could we carry true mother love to all humanity? No life need be a failure. Great is the work before us.